Well, good morning and welcome to our morning service here in Bethel Baptist. Uh, it's great to have your company uh, once again this morning. Obviously, we are not in the chapel as we would have wished, um, but it's good that we can meet together, albeit in this strange way. We thank you. Uh, we thank the Lord that on uh, the turn of a new year, that his truth is unchanging. Please do get in touch with me. Uh, I'm, as you can see, back from our holiday. We didn't go anywhere. We, as I said last time, we went from the back room to the front room, from the front room to the back room, and again. But we had a lovely time. Thank you for all your cards and your lovely gifts as well over the Christmas period. But please, if you do need anything, please get in touch with me. Uh, it's good to hear your voice. Uh, and um, please uh, ring uh, and get in touch if you would like anything. Uh, that would be lovely to hear you. Uh, this coming week, we have a, a Zoom prayer meeting on Thursday, uh, and uh, we invite you warmly to that. If you'd like the code, if you get in touch with one of the uh, elders and the deacons. And then next Sunday, we have a service this evening uh, at six o'clock on social media. And then next Sunday as well, we have a service this morning and evening. And God willing, uh, I will be uh, taking those services. Well, shall we come to the Lord in prayer? Shall we pray together? O oh Lord of our God, we do come before you, and we come before you to praise you, to worship you, to give thanks that you alone are the Lord God Almighty. We give thanks that there is none like you. And Lord, as we begin, as it were, a, a new year together, Lord, an uncertain time, a very difficult time, we thank you for this wonderful truth that the Lord Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you uh, that, uh, as we looked in the prayer meeting on Thursday, that nothing can separate us from your love. We thank you for the truth of this word, that the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, you display to us, our Father, on that cross, his resurrection, that nothing can change these truths. Lord, we do pray for one another. We pray for those who are experiencing COVID at the moment. We pray for uh, our dear brother Ron and the family. We thank you that some of them are much better. And we pray that you would be with them and continue to have your hand upon them. Lord, we pray for those who perhaps are living on their own and in this lockdown are lonely and it is difficult. Lord, we ask that you would be by their side. Lord, we pray for those who are working on frontline services. And we pray that you'd have your hand upon them, that you would keep them. And Lord, we would ask that in this very difficult time, you would raise up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the great physician. Lord, yes, we thank you that in the Lord Jesus, that when he returns, we will have new bodies. But we also thank you that when in the Lord Jesus as well, that we can have today through him restoration with yourself. O oh Lord, our God, we therefore ask you that in this service we would know something of yourself. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are going to sing together. Uh, usually, uh, the first time I preach in the new year, we, are, we have a motto verse. And we will be having a motto verse for the year in a minute. And the verse is about the cross, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, we're going to sing now about the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. Shall we sing together? And after we've sung, we're going to have a children's story.
he did. But not you, Conrad. Well, kids, gather round, gather round. It's good to have your company. Uh, have you eaten all your Christmas chocolates? Or are there still some hiding with you uh, here or there? Uh, and I hope you had some lovely presents. What I want to show you is one of the presents that we had. Well, actually, my little boy, the smallest boy, the baby had Osha. You like it? He had some lovely presents. Lovely presents. Thank you to everybody. But this is one of the presents that Auntie Pat gave him. An elephant. Uh, but it's an elephant, as you see, with a difference. Now, let me show it. Whoop. I don't know if I can hold them all. There are these little blocks in them. There are these little blocks in them. And Oshan tries his best. He loves this little elephant. Uh, and I play a lot with him. And Oshan tries his best to put the blocks. And sometimes he can, because oh, he's only small. But sometimes he can put the blocks in. But sometimes he can't. Now, I want you to imagine that I've, that I've made a challenge for Oshan. He's got to put all the blocks in the right places or he doesn't have any tea he doesn't have any tea he's got to put all the blocks in the right places or he doesn't have any tea well do you know what although he sometimes get them close that wouldn't be good enough he would have to get them all in and do you know the only way at the moment when he's a bit older i'm sure he'll do it but at the moment the only way he could do that is if i did them i helped him with it put the star where the star goes and put the hexagon where the hexagon goes and put the square and if i did it i it would be too difficult for him to do that he wouldn't get any tea he couldn't do it on his own do you know what many people think oh i can get to god on my own if I live a good life, if I try my best, God's bound to accept me. But we're going to read about a man now called the Apostle Paul. And he realised that his best was never good enough. He couldn't do it alone. He couldn't reach God alone. And he realised he didn't need to reach God alone because God had done everything for him by sending Jesus to die on the cross for his sins and the apostle paul stopped trusting in himself oh i can get to god on my own and he trusted in jesus christ and his cross and god accepted him and that's the good news we have today is that god has done everything for us so we can be accepted by him through sending jesus to the cross and all we need to do is come yes our sinners confess our sin and trust in Jesus Christ as our Saviour. Indeed, Paul says that he boasts in Jesus Christ and his cross. What do you boast in? What do you think? Oh, this is the best thing ever. Well, Paul boasts in Jesus and his cross, and we're going to read about that now. We're going to read from the Bible, from the New Testament, from Galatians chapter 6, and we're going to read from verses 11 to 18. Galatians chapter 6, verses 11 to 18. This is God's word. See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised obey the law. Yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor un uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule even to the rule of Israel of God. Finally, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Well, shall we pray together? O Lord, our God, we come before you at the beginning of the new year, and we worship you. 
we praise you and thank you that there is something that is worth to boast in. Lord, in many ways as we begin this new year, we're in very much the same place as the last year. Things are very uncertain, Lord, due to this COVID. And many people, perhaps ourselves, are, are mourning are, and have just had enough and don't feel we can carry on, Lord. But, oh Lord, we thank you that there is something worth boasting in this morning. We thank you that there is something or someone that his work on the cross will never, ever, ever change. We thank you that even if we are home on our own, that if we trust in Jesus and his cross, that you are with us and that you are promised never to leave us or forsake us. We thank you, Lord. We, we pray now that we can count our blessings and thank you for them. We thank you, Lord, that in Jesus Christ there is forgiveness of sin. All the wrong we've ever thought and said and done in Jesus Christ can be wiped clean. We thank you, Lord, that in Jesus Christ you count us as not guilty. Not guilty, although, Lord, we've broken every command that you have. And yet, through the cross of Jesus, you count us as not guilty. But we also thank you that through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, through his resurrection, through faith in Jesus, we we are counted right in your sight, but we are clothed with the perfection, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, we thank you that, yes, Jesus was a sacrifice who went to the cross, but we thank you that he was a sacrifice, a perfect sacrifice. We thank you that he lived the perfect life that we can't live. And, oh, Lord, our God, we do thank you that when we trust in Jesus, our sin is counted to Jesus on the cross. But his perfection, his righteousness is counted to us. And you don't see our sin anymore. You see the perfection of Jesus. Oh Lord, our God, we thank you that we're accepted fully in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that by trusting in Jesus, that no COVID, no uncertainty that this world can throw towards us can change that. Lord, this morning you know all about us. You know all about where we stand with you. Lord, if there are any of us here this morning, we're not sure if we're Christians. Oh, Lord, would you this morning bring us to the same place as Paul was, to boast in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know others of us, perhaps we are your children, but we are cold, Lord, and we are struggling, and we perhaps almost want to give up. Oh, Lord, would you warm our hearts this morning with this wonderful message of the cross. Oh Lord, would you deal with our hearts? You also know about our situations. You know about our difficulties. You know about perhaps the grief that we bear in our heart, grief for lost ones uh, and loved ones that we have lost. Uh, Lord, we ask that you would help us and keep us. We ask that you would speak to us, Lord. Lord, you know the desire of our hearts as a church. The desire of our hearts as a church is that we could meet again soon together. And Lord, we'd ask that in your will that this would become possible in your time. Lord, we also remember Christians uh, who are abroad and our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted. Lord, they might not even know it's a new year. They might not even know the date because they are incarcerated. They're locked up. They see no daylight. Oh Lord, we pray that in countries such as China, such as North Korea, such as Eritrea, uh, in, Af in the Horn of Africa, Nigeria, and the Middle East, that although perhaps they don't see the light of day, we do pray that they would see the light of your Son. Oh Lord, would you help us now to listen to your word, and that as we leave this service this morning, as it were, that we would know what it is to meet with the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, turn with me uh, to Galatians chapter 6, to the reading uh, that we just had there, uh, because we're going to have a, a motto verse from uh, Galatians 6 in a moment. Do you remember this quote? God himself couldn't sink this ship. You know what ship I'm talking about. Of course, the Titanic. A worker who'd been working to help build the Titanic 
had said that God himself couldn't sink this ship. Now, if there was ever a boast which was tragically to prove foolish, that was it. We all know the tragic end of the Titanic in 1912. What is a boast? Why do people boast? Well, we boast because we're placing our confidence in something. We boast because we want to have some kind of identity in what we boast in. Perhaps we get our self-worth from what we boast in. The thing we boast in gives us security. And quite naturally, that worker on the Titanic, in his day, the ship was the one and all, uh, the bee's knees of a ship, as it were. He was placing his confidence. He was building his identity, gaining his self-worth, yes, even his security in that ship and being a part of it. So, so he boasted God himself couldn't, couldn't sink that ship. But of course, it was an empty boast. Because the thing he tried to gain his confidence from, the thing he tried to gain his identity, the ship that he gained his self-worth from, his security from, it could not deliver. 2021. What we are, what are you going to be boasting in? We need to boast in something that it gives us rock solid confidence, an identity, a self worth, a security that COVID itself cannot take away from us. And that's why our motto verse this year comes from Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. Paul says this May I never boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. You see, it's here in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ that Paul places his confidence. It's from the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ that Paul gets his identity, his self-worth. And it's in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ where Paul sees his ultimate security. Let's read the verse again. May I never boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And as we face an uncertain 2021, I want to draw three truths from Paul's boast this morning. The first thing is this. Blow your own trumpet. That's our first title. Blow your own trumpet. Why did the Apostle Paul think he needed to make this boast in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ? He was writing to a Christian church. Wasn't it obvious that they, as Christians, would be boasting in the cross of the Lord Jesus? Well, Paul needed to make this boast because there were people who had joined the church in Galatia. Paul is writing to the Galatian churches who were blowing their own trumpet. False teachers from a Jewish persuasion had infiltrated the churches in Galatia. And they were saying that Paul's message about faith in Jesus and his cross, that, that that was okay, but that you needed an extra. They were putting a plus to Paul's gospel. Oh yes, it was okay to believe that Jesus had died on the cross for your sin, but also you needed to follow Jewish rites, Jewish ceremonies, and especially that if you wanted to be a proper Christian, wanted to be properly right with God, you had to be circumcised. Now, this had been a problem in the early church. Uh, the apostles had preached the gospel that Jesus Christ had died on the cross for sin and that we needed to repent and trust in Jesus, that Jesus had done all the work for us in his death and resurrection. But then people from a Jewish background would come into these churches uh, which some of them were, a majority of them were from Gentile, non-Jewish backgrounds, and Jews would come and say, well, yes, that's okay, believing in Jesus and his cross, but you must follow Jewish rituals. You must be circumcised as well. Perhaps the classic example is in Acts chapter 15, in the great council of Jerusalem. Some Jewish people came there and said, unless you are circumcised, according to the customs taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. The cross they were saying, is not enough to save you. And they had come, these Jewish false teachers, and they arrived in Galatia as well. 
And you see, what these Jewish false teachers were doing was boasting in themselves, blowing their own trumpet. What Jesus did on the cross is not enough to save us. To put us right with God, we've got a part to play as well. We've got to follow these Jewish rituals. We've got to circumcise, be circumcised. You see, it was DIY religion, do-it-yourself religion. You had to add something to Jesus' work on the cross in order to be saved. Now, you all know that I'm a, a Scarlet supporter, but I want you to imagine that I'm having a chat with a die-hard, one-eyed Scarlet supporter. We'll call him Jim Scarlet. Jim Scarlet. And I say to Jim, oh, Jim, I'm a Scarlet supporter. And he says, are you really? Are you really a Scarlet supporter? Do you wear a Scarlet shirt every day? And I say, well, well, well yes, I try to wear a Scarlet shirt every day, right? But what about the tracksuit, the Scarlet tracksuit? What about socks? What about pants? What about hat? Uh, and have you got every program match day program the scholars have ever played ever going back to the 19th century oh, well no jim I, I, and have you got tattooed on your back scarlets till i die no jim i haven't well you're not like me jim scarlet you're not a proper scarlet supporter then are you and that's in some senses how these false teachers were in galatia you say you believe in the cross of the Lord Jesus, but that's not enough. You're not proper like we are. I follow the Jewish customs. I've been circumcised. I'm really saved. They're blowing their own trumpet. Now, why were they doing this? Well, do-it-yourself religion, DIY religion, is an outward religion. It's all about being seen to do what is right, being seen to do what is good. Indeed, Paul says in verse, six, in verse 12 of chapter 6, those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised, want to make a good impression outwardly. It was all about an outward act. Indeed, circumcision itself is an outward act. But of course, in the Old Testament, the outward act of circumcision symbolized an inward act, the circumcision of the heart, of God being placed on the throne of a person's heart. It was an inward work that the outward sign of circumcision demonstrated. But of course, for these false teachers, they don't want God on the throne of their heart, not at all. The outward act, the ceremonies, that's all that's important. And you see, an outward religion is very easy. You do a few good things and you do them in the correct order so everybody can see what you're doing. It's easy. Why? Because it doesn't ask me to enthrone God in my heart. It doesn't challenge me. I'm doing the good deeds. I'm following this outward pattern of religion. It's me, not God, who's in charge. You see, mere outward religion doesn't challenge me. And not only did these false teachers follow an outward dead religion, they weren't only following an outward religion, they were doing that because it was popular. They had the applause, the appreciation of other people. Again, verse 12 of chapter 6. Those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to compel you to be circumcised. They wanted to make a good impression. They wanted to be liked. I want you to imagine the Galatia Church Facebook page. And there's a post on it. I've been a good Jewish Christian. As you know, I've walked all the old ladies to help them cross the road to the Sunday service. Uh, and I give a 10% of all of my income to the poor. And every time there's a circumcision ceremony, I, I make sure I give money to celebrate the occasion. And of course, the thumbs up, the likes, they keep on pinging. Wow, what a good person he or she is. You see, outward religion is popular. It gives the feel for good factor. It gives the applause. Other people blow your trumpet because they think you're a good person. And that's what these false teachers really wanted. They knew that Christ and his cross was not going to win, were not going to win them any fanfares. Verse 12 of chapter 6 again. 
The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. They knew that if they said Jesus, his cross was all that you need, and there's nothing we can add to that, they knew that they would be persecuted. Go back to the Galatia Church Facebook page. There's another post on it. Somebody saying this, I tried DIY religion. I've tried being a good person. It got me nowhere. Thank you, Jesus, for your cross. It's the only way. But there's no thumbs up there. Uh, there's no uh, back patting there. Just comments such as, why are you so narrow saying that Jesus is the only way? The false teachers in Galatia blew their own trumpets. They boasted of what they had done because, quite frankly, pointing people to the cross of the Lord Jesus was not going to win them the popularity vote. But Paul is having none of it. There was only one place uh, and one thing Paul was going to boast in. Verse 14, our key verse, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our second point is blowing the fanfare of the cross. Blowing the fanfare of the cross. Now the letter to the Galatians perhaps is one of Paul's earliest letters, one of the earliest letters he wrote. But if you compare Paul's letters to each other, there is one fanfare that blows through them all, the message of the cross. If you turn to a little later letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, this is what Paul says there. For I resolved to know nothing uh, while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Do you see what Paul is doing there? Exactly the same as he's doing here in Galatia. The Lord Jesus Christ and his cross was the central message, the crescendo of the gospel good news that Paul preached. And for preaching the cross, Paul was persecuted. We read in verse 17 here in chapter 6 of Galatians. Finally, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Now, this isn't some kind of weird stigmata that lots of hocus pocus people have gone out that the, the wounds of the cross appeared on Paul. Not at all. These are the beatings Paul had for the preaching of the cross. These were the bruises he was beaten with because he preached the cross. You see, unlike the message of the false teachers, the DIY religion, people were offended by Paul's preaching of the cross. He mentions that. In chapter 5, verse 11, look it up. He talks about the offence of the cross. Why were people, why are people so offended by the fanfare of the cross? Well, when you come to the cross, there are some glorious, triumphant major notes. But there are also some damning minor notes as well. What do I mean? Well, why the cross? Why did the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, why did he have to die on the cross? Well, Paul, in his introduction to the letter of Galatians, chapter 1, verse 4, he says this about Jesus. Who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age. Who gave himself for our sins. That's the damning note that people naturally won't accept. That the Lord Jesus Christ had to die on the cross for our sin. That the Lord Jesus Christ bled, was nailed to that cross and bled, was tortured there. And as he was being doing that, it wasn't just a human act, but that God the Father was placing our sins upon his own son. And that the Lord Jesus Christ was taking the punishment for my sin and for your sin. The holy, pure God, whose punishment I deserve, I deserve to be apart from him. I deserve to be apart from him from eternity because I'm a sinner. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ on that cross took all the punishment I deserve. And that's where people are offended. Oh, I'm not perfect. But a sinner? Not right with God? Under his eternal judgment? And you're saying me, that's why the Lord Jesus Christ died? No way, I can't accept that. Oh, okay, 
that Jesus did die on the cross, and, and I can accept that he died there as an example of great love for us to follow, but as a sacrifice for sin, my sin, no way. And yet, it is exactly in the cross that causes so much offence to so many people that the Apostle Paul boasts in. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why does the Apostle Paul boast in this offensive cross? Because Paul, in his conversion, realised he had nothing in and of himself to boast about. He had nothing in and of himself to make him right with God. If you read another one of his letters, uh, the letter he, wrote to, he writes to the church in Philippi, you read that the Apostle Paul is quite an impressive person. Philippians 3, chapter, uh, chapter 5. I circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. Now, these false teachers in Galatia, they would have thought, Paul, naturally, he is wonderful. He's, you can't get a better Jewish heritage than the Apostle Paul had. But when he becomes a Christian, or as he becomes a Christian, he realizes that his best efforts, all of his own achievements, are useless, rubbish. He calls them done to make him right to the holy and pure God. Listen to what he says next in verse 7 of Philippians 3. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish. Done. That's what he means. Lost. Uh, rubbish. That I may gain Christ and be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. What's Paul saying then? Well, he's echoing his great boast in Galatians 6 verse 14. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Paul has seen the major notes of the cross as well. Not only the minor note that he is a sinner, no God, he's seen the major cross notes as well. It's only through the Lord Jesus Christ, only through him dying for my sin, taking the punishment that I deserve, that I can be placed right with God. You see, through God's grace, Paul realized by trusting in the Lord Jesus and his cross, he as a person was declared not guilty in the sight of God. He'd received forgiveness of sins. He'd realized that it was only through trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ to the cross that God could accept him, a sinner. Indeed, more than that, that God would clothe him with the perfection, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Through faith in Jesus, this great swap had happened to the Apostle Paul. All of his sin had been counted on the cross to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christ's perfect standing with God, his righteousness, Paul was clothed with that. You see what's here? God accepts the sinner, but doesn't count his sin towards him, because it's been counted to Christ, and God counts Jesus' perfection, righteousness to the sinner. What a swap! You see, Paul saw that God in the Lord Jesus Christ had done everything for him. There was nothing at all that needed to be added to the work of the cross. And through faith in, in Christ and the cross, Paul had a concrete confidence that he was now right with God. Paul indeed had, had a worth, a value, which far surpassed anything that this world gives us self-worth and self-value. God had loved him. God had sent his son to him. And God had given everything for him. He had an identity that he was God's child. And he had a security, as verse 16 says, of peace with God. No wonder that Paul boasts in the cross. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
What are you boasting in this morning? What is going to keep you, not only through 2021, but what is going to keep you for eternity? One of the striking aspects of COVID is that it has crushed the boasts of the 21st century ego, of human 21st century ego. Human 21st century ego, we can do anything we want to do. Uh, we're the masters of our own lives. I can't even go in, because of COVID, to my next door neighbour's house. How on earth can I be the masters of my own life? It's just a fraud. Or another great uh, humanist, uh, or uh, another great secular theory. People really are good. People really are good. Deep down, they're good. And we want to put others first. We're naturally good. We're not naturally selfish. Is that what you see? Why do the politicians go on and on and on and tell us, you need to keep the rules, you need to keep the rules, you need to keep the rules, or this COVID is going to spread? Why do they do that? Well, because I want to live my life how I want to live it. Okay, I know I should follow the rules and, and not spread the virus on, but, but basically I can't do that because I want my freedom to live life as I want to do it. COVID shattering this, that we're basically generous, great people naturally not. And of course, another boast of modern society, education. Education is good, don't get me wrong. But our society has made education into some kind of demigod. Uh, we see in education society at its fairest, everyone getting the same opportunity of learning to make something of themselves. And then COVID comes along. And the poorest in our society, they don't have the laptops, they don't have the iPads, they don't have the technology. Their parents have to go out because they're on zero hours contracts to put food on the table and children miss out. Education won't save them. You go through all the boasts, the gods of our godless society and COVID has smashed them all. The boasting is empty. But you see, the fanfare of the cross is never silenced. Christ and his cross is the only certain path of forgiveness of sin, the only certain peace of God with God, the only certainty that you can be a child of God. Yes, of heaven itself. It is a boast, the cross of Christ, that COVID can never smash. You see, Paul is boasting of the cross, isn't an empty noise. No, the cross of Christ has changed Paul's life. You could say that for Paul, he has been blown away by the cross. That's our third and last title. Paul has been blown away by the cross. What does he say in verse 14? May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. The world has been crucified to Paul. And he's been crucified, he's died to the world. Today, if I'm right, is Sunday, the 10th of January. How are the New Year's resolutions going on? New Year, fresh start, time to try and change your life. But if you're anything like me, usually by January the 10th, the New Year's resolutions have crashed. Now, one thing's for certain is that Paul has changed. He's a changed man. And it wasn't a New Year's resolution that changed him. It was the cross, which the world through the cross has been crucified to me and I through the world. He has been blown away by the cross. Believing the crucified Christ has had such an effect on the Apostle Paul that the change that has happened to him, he compares it with death and new life. Through the power of the cross, the world has died, has been crucified to Paul, and he has died, been crucified to the world. Now, now what is the world here? Well, it's not the globe. Uh, Paul isn't given a, a geography lesson. The world here is the sinful, rebellious opposition to God. Before trusting in the Lord Jesus and his cross, the world with a sinful rebellion against God, that's what governed Paul. That's what was Paul's boss. But now, through faith in Christ and his cross, Paul has died to having the world, with its, all its sin and rebellion, as his master. Sometimes you watch uh, films, perhaps a gangster movie or something like that, and um, there's a family falling out. And the son turns to the father and the son says, you're dead to me. 
What does he mean? Where the relationship has come to an end. Uh, the Father doesn't mean anything anymore. And Paul, through Christ on the cross, says that the relationship with the sinful, rebellious world is broken. It's come to an end. He's died, as it were, with Christ on that cross. He still lives in the world. He still talks to the people in the world. He hasn't become a monk. But the world's sinful values and its temptations, its rebellion against God, it's not what drives Paul anymore. Trusting in Christ and, the, and his cross has caused a death in Christ. You see, Paul hasn't made a New Year's resolution. Something much more drastic has happened with Paul. Through faith in Christ and his cross, he's died. He's died to his old self. He's died to the influence and the power of the world. In what specific way has he died to the rebellion of the sinful world? Well, first of all, he's not trying to earn his own way. That's the ethos of the world. I don't need God's love. I don't need Christ and his cross, his forgiveness. I'm all right, Jack. I I'll prove myself. I'll earn my own way to heaven. That's what these false teachers were really saying. Through circumcision and Jewish ceremonial rites, they were trying to earn brownie points with God. But Paul has finished with all that. He's died with a sin for that sinful way of thinking. Christ, and through his cross, Christ has done everything for him, and that's done everything needed for his salvation. He's trusted in Christ, and he's died to this worldly, sinful way of thinking, I'm good enough, I can earn my way with God. But obviously, linked to that also, Paul, through faith in Christ and his cross, has died to the popularity game of the world. Why did these false teachers preach DIY religion? Well, don't you remember we said it made them very popular. If you tell the people you can be the hero, you through your own efforts can reach God, people will love you for that. Uh, they'll buy your books, they'll download your self-help podcasts, they'll want your autograph. But Paul had seen, through grace, the lie. Self-help religion, self-effort religion, cannot take you to God. God has done all that is needed through his son on the cross. And that wasn't a popular message. Nobody wanted Paul's autograph for preaching Christ crucified. And yet, you see, this is the point. After experiencing the love of God, through sending his own son, Jesus, to die on the cross, after experiencing forgiveness, after experiencing that he was now, through Jesus' cross, accepted with God, that he was a child of God, do you know? He didn't care about the popularity game of the world. So what if the world isn't like him? I'm a child of God, through Jesus Christ and his cross. So what if they think I'm odd? So what if they think I'm nuts? Paul didn't care. He had something much, much greater, a security, an identity that was unshakable through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was God's child and he was going to heaven. One of the major stumbling blocks for Christians in the West is that we crave the popularity of the world around us. We change our values, we change our principles just to be liked. What's the problem there? We haven't understood the cross. We haven't understood that in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I've died with Christ. I don't care if people don't, as it were, like me. I'm not going out to be odd. I'm not going out to be irksome. But if they don't like me because I follow Christ, if I don't fit in because of Christ, does that matter? No. Why? Because through the cross of Christ, I fit in with the Lord God Almighty who created the whole universe. Christ has offered me much more than this world can do. Or to put it the other way, the other side of the coin, yes, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul had died to authority of this world, but he's also been made alive. Or as he says in verse 15, he's been made a new creation. Verse 15, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation. You see, it wasn't circumcision, it wasn't outward rites, 
what counted that through the cross, Paul had been brought to a new earth, to a new creation. He says this again in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. It's been the mother, if you want, of all new years in the Christian's life. The old has gone. The new has come. The problem with New Year's resolutions is that usually they don't change a thing. The intention may be very good. Very good to stop eating too much chocolate. Very good to stop drinking or whatever it is. But the problem is me. I just cannot change myself. I haven't got the power to change myself. And that's how we are as sinners. Sin is too deep. It's too ingrained in me. By myself, I can't root it out. But here is Christ. He goes to the cross. And my sinful self is nailed to him on the cross. He dies there. And the grip and the power that sin has over me also dies. And of course, he's risen from the dead. And he's raised from the dead. And through faith, through faith, by trusting in Jesus, I'm risen with him to a new life, to a new creation. The cross of Christ has the power to make us new people. And Paul had been blown away by the cross. No New Year's resolution could change him, but the cross did. What will you boast in this year? We face a very, very uncertain 2021. What will keep you? What will give you identity? What will ground you? What will give you confidence and value in your life? Where's the Titanic today? Same place as it's been tragically since 1912 the bottom of the ocean. All human boasts, in the end, become shipwrecks. They promised everything, but they delivered nothing. But no matter how uncertain the times are, no matter what icebergs are going to come across us, the Christian has a boast that will keep him through 2021 and for eternity. May I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For his name's sake. Amen. Shall we pray together? O Lord, our God, we thank you that there is a solid rock, the Lord Jesus Christ, for us to stand upon. We thank you that there is a boast that is not empty. Because we're not boasting in ourselves or on none of our power, but we're boasting in the in the crucified, risen Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this second, Lord, this moment, you know every one of us, would you bring us all to trust in our Saviour, the Lord Jesus, so that we can face this year and eternity, certain that whatever happens, we are safe in him. Amen. Well, to close, we are going to uh, sing together. Uh, we're going to sing Isaac Watts' hymn, When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss, and poor content in all my pride. And here it is in the second verse. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God, all the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. Shall we sing together? And as we do, I bid you good morning. And I'll see you this evening.